What's up, God Speak? If you have a Bible, you want to open to Genesis chapter 12 tonight for our message, Conflicts of the Soul. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. Our service team will get one to you. We need one up here. A couple, one back there. Keep those hands up. They'll get them to you. We're working our way on Saturday nights, verse by verse, through the incredible book of beginnings. That's what Genesis means. And we have entered into the life, last message was about Old Testament discipleship with Abraham. You see, God calls his servants throughout the scriptures, Old Testament, New Testament, in the same way. Hey, come follow me, I got a plan for you. Because you see, the way God interacts with humans is he gives us divine revelation that requires faith and obedience in following him. And the Lord had called Abraham out, his name is Abram, it hasn't changed yet, but going back and forth between Abram and Abraham, and Abra- I just call him Abraham, you guys will have to figure out the semantics as we're going through it. But the reality is, is that God has called a man and uh, a wife to go to a strange land. He's gonna give them a country, a nation. He's gonna build them into a great nation. He's gonna bless their socks off. Abraham's name's gonna be great. We're here talking about it 4,000 years after the fact. The land of Israel is still in the possession of the Israelites. And as we see these things unfold, this is the next step in the progression of discipleship. How many of you had the honeymoon of discipleship? You got saved and it just seemed like everywhere you turned, God was just working. You said a prayer, boom, there it was. You said a prayer for that parking spot at Costco, boom. It was like a miracle, parting of the Red Sea. Everywhere you turned, it's just like the blessings of God. I had one of those kind of experiences, a supernatural conversion, and the Lord uh, radically saved me. And Stephen tells us in Acts chapter 7 that the God of glory appeared to Abraham in Mesopotamia and he called him to go to this land. Now he did have a little uh, delay because his pop Tara had slowed him down. They got as far as Haran, they stopped, had to wait for Pop to pass away because he couldn't get him all the way to the promised land. Because you know, some people are holding us back from the ultimate call of God in our life. I remember when the Lord years ago called me to go to San Jose to help a church there. And I had my wife and our two little uh, precious kids at the time. And we stood in the driveway of my, my wife is an only child. So uh, her parents, Uh, obviously, not only they're great parents, they have great affection for Tammy, but it's the only grandkids. So we're in the U-Haul, we're getting ready to pull out of the driveway, and we're gonna go to California. We're gonna take the grandkids out of state. Now, the grandkids have been 10 minutes away up to this point. And, uh, (laughs) And Tammy's mother looked at me and her chin began to quiver. And she began to cry. And she looked, she said, you, meaning me, you, you can go. They're all staying with me. Please don't go. You know, if she would have had it, she, if she would have had a million bucks, she would have offered me a million bucks on the spot. And I said, Lana, she was not a believer at that time. And I said, Lana, I got to do what God wants me to do. Now, to an unbeliever, that makes no sense, right? They don't get God talking to you. And uh, she was mad at me and held a grudge for three years. She was so torqued off. I thought in all these years that have went by, almost 30 years have went by, she'd have forgotten about it. But just a couple of weeks ago, she told my daughter all about that bitterness. She hasn't forgot a thing (laughs) after 30 years. But Abraham now has gotten to the promised land, but now he has his first test. You see, God is raising kids and he doesn't pamper his kids. He allows us to go through trials and adversity so that we will grow in perseverance, that we'll grow in character, that we'll be filled with hope about our confidence in God. And so here, Abraham, he has some conflicts in the soul. Check it out. We're going to pick it up in verse 10 of chapter 12 as we see him in conflict first with his circumstances. In verse 10 it says, Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to dwell there, for the famine was severe in the land. He has his conflict. Now he's had a little conflict and delay with his family already, and we're going to return to that uh, vignette in a moment. 
But now he's got a conflict with his circumstances. Now, wait a second. God, you told me to travel 500 miles from Ur of the Chaldees to this promised land that you were going to bless me. And now I arrive here and there's a severe famine. You see, a land that is requires there in the Mediterranean for dry land farming, it, you need the early and latter rains to have a crop. So if it doesn't rain, man, the famine is severe. Why go to Egypt? Because the Egypt, the uh, Nile Delta, because of the way it floods, even if there's a famine from rain everywhere else, the Nile Delta was this incredible fertile place that always had resources and crops. That's why years later, Joseph's going to be there during a severe famine and be able to collect all the grain to save the Mediterranean. And in this experience, it tells us that Abram, he went down to Egypt. Egypt becomes a type of the world. Pharaoh becomes a type of the devil. All the way through scripture, when you go to Egypt, it's like you're going back to lean on your own logic, your own resources. You're not trusting God. The children of Israel, when God calls them out of Egypt and they murmur and complain, what do they say they want to do? Go back to Egypt. They want to go back to that place. And even though they were slaves there, they were in bondage there. They want to run back to that place of security. But you see, the world's security versus faith in God are two different dynamics. When God asks us to trust us through the famines in our soul, the conflict that's going on in your soul, there's something tonight going on in your soul, there's like a famine, and you say to yourself, what I'm going through in my marriage, what I'm going through in this relational conflict. What I'm, I do not have the resources to do this. I'm not going to trust God. I'm going to try to figure out my own way. I will never have the kind of marriage that I want. So you're about ready to throw in the tile and go to Egypt and find a new person. You see, it's when you give up on trusting that God is going to bring you through the famine because you see, God called Abram to come to the promised land, the land of promise, and he wants him to trust him there and when things get tough, not just run back to the old worldly ways of trusting in Egypt. At the end of this portion of scripture, we're gonna see, and he went up out of Egypt, because you always come up out of Egypt, and when you go back, to, it's like down, down, down. Your life is just stepping downward. It's very much like Jonah, when God told Jonah to go to those Ninevites and preach, it says, Jonah went down to Joppa, he went down into a ship, and then he, then he went down into the sea, and then he went down into the belly of the great sea creature. As you step away from God's best for you, no matter what the adversity is, that he wants you to trust, he wants you to trust him right now. What are you going through in your own famine, in your own conflict, the own, your own struggle, and rather than just say, God, I trust you, I, I'm going to look to you. I don't want to figure out another answer here. I want to trust you. And this is what Abraham, uh, Abram in his maturity had not grown to that place. Now he's going to repeat this some years later because sometimes we have to take the remedial class. You ever flunk, flunk a test? And you have to go take the test again? He's going to have to do that. So this severe famine... So he's going to go to Egypt. He goes down to Egypt. Now he's, he's got a conflict with this deep fear, this deep concern inside of him about Egypt and Egypt's reputation. For it says in verse 11, And it came to pass when he was close to entering Egypt that he said to Sarai, his wife, Indeed, I know that you are a woman of beautiful countenance. Ah, oh, thanks, honey. What a nice compliment. We're on our way to Egypt. Here you are giving me compliments. No, no, wait, wait. I'm not done. Therefore, it will happen when the Egyptians see you that they will say, this is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Please say you are my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake, that I may live because of you. You see, as soon as I step away from trusting God by faith, I begin to walk towards fear. I begin to be motivated in my life by fear. Now fears are governing my heart. 
Fears are governing my life. My own insecurities. Because as soon as I w move away from God's plan, you see the confidence, even if it's a famine going on, even if it, it feels like the, the, everything's busting loose around me, as long as I know I'm in the center of God's will, I have this incredible confidence. But as soon as I begin to depart from God's will, then I'm feel, filled with fear, insecurity, and anxiety. He's deep he has a deep concern. And this is the reputation, by the way, of the Egyptians. The Egyptians were really down on adultery, so they, not, they weren't down on murder. So if they saw a little hottie down the street, they don't mind killing you so that they can marry her. At least they could say, I'm not an adulterer, <laughs> even though I'm a murderer. Now, this is kind of mind-blowing because Sarah is 65 years old, and she is drop-dead gorgeous. She's beautiful. At 65 years of age. He's not blowing smoke like, honey, you're really cute. No, no, she's very, very beautiful. So the conflict is now he's, he's, his self-preservation is going to put her in a terrible position to be available for the Pharaoh and another man. So when she agrees with, she's the co-conspirator because they're now both operating in security. Oh, honey, I don't want you to be killed. Well, then lie for me, baby. And that is, it's a half lie because they have the same father and different mothers. So uh, she is his sister, but not by the mother and father. It's kind of a hillbilly thing going on right here. Okay, <laughs> just, just so that you know, all right? <laughs> uh, because of use. So in verse 14, it wasn't. It wasn't an illegitimate concern, verse 14. So it was, when Abram came into Egypt, that the Egyptians saw the woman, that she was very beautiful. The princes of Pharaoh also saw her and commended her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. He treated Abram well for her. Now the upside to this is he gets paid in sheep, oxen, male uh, donkeys, male and female servants, female donkeys, and camels. He gets a big <laughs> payday. For his lovely bride. <laughs> I know a pastor, he was in Israel on a tour, and sometimes you go to Petra, you go across the country into Jordan, in, in a Muslim area, and uh, this pastor's wife is this very beautiful blonde woman, and a man came up to him sincerely that was Muslim, and he said, Sir, I, 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 will, give you, I will give you four camels for your wife. <laughs> this, is a, this is a true story. And he goes... No, I'm sorry, sir. I'll take six. <laughs> he gets this big payday, but he watches his wife go into the harem of another man. Now, what do you think the conflict in the soul is going on? Women, please don't speak out loud. What's going through your mind if you were just sold for a few donkeys and camels into Pharaoh's harem, but your husband's alive and well, he's over there killing him? Like, I thought you were a husband, and now I think you're my pimp? What's going on? Because fear and insecurity makes us do stupid things. And fear and insecurity, when we get outside of God's will, who do we hurt the most? The people that are closest to us. Who's the collateral damage to my stupidity? My precious wife, right? If I'm out of God's will, if I'm out of step, if I'm not walking in the spirit, who gets hurt? She does. You see, the people, sometimes we think, hey, I'm, not, I'm do, just doing my own thing. I'm not hurting anybody. Ever. No, no, you are. The Bible says no one lives to themselves, nobody dies to themselves, meaning that I go through life and I affect people and affect, people affect me. And Abram, in his immaturity, and his fearfulness, even though Sarai was complicit, she was, okay, honey, I don't want you to die. I guess I'll say that I'm your sister, I'm your half-sister. So now here's Sarah. She's in the harem. Think of it, ladies. Right? You're waiting for some ugly pharaoh to come into your bedroom for your honeymoon. He's got multiple wives, right? And he's got 20, 30. Now you're in the list. Now some of you don't be thinking, you know, think, hey, how about a trip to Egypt, right? You're gonna trade one in? The funny thing is, is that these stories, when you bring them into your own heart and life and see 
how out of step sometimes we are in our own fears and the decisions we're making, it brings it into reality of who we're really hurting, the people around us. This happens to Abram, and though he's the father of faith, he is leading the way to teach you and I some valuable lessons in this passage of Scripture. What not to do. Then there's a conflict with the consequences, because in verse 17, but the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this you have done to me? Why did you tell me that she was your sister? Excuse me, your wife. And why did you say she is my sister? I might have taken her as my wife, meaning I might have consummated the marriage. She didn't go into her bedroom. Now, therefore, here is your wife. Take her and go your way. For Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him. They sent him away with his wife and all that he had. So now, on top of this, I'm I'm a servant of God, Abram. I'm talking my wife into lying because I'm afraid and insecure. I lose my wife to another man in his harem, and then I get rebuked by an ungodly individual rebuking me, the father of faith, the man of God. Have you ever been rebuked from your failure as a Christian by non-Christians? I have, it's very, very embarrassing. Have you ever had somebody that looked at you and said, I thought you were a Christian. I thought you were, and they just fill in the blank. You know, you've told me about Jesus, and here you are, here at, whether it's at work or a friend or a neighbor or a family member, and you behave like that. There's nothing more humiliating than being dressed down, so to speak, by an ungodly person, and at that moment, they're more godly and more righteous and more moral than you are. That's what's happening to Abraham. It's very humbling, very embarrassing, the conflict that he now has, and it's not only with Pharaoh. Pharaoh's the most powerful man in all of Egypt, so it's like he's the king, he's the president, and so everybody from the top down, they basically are, he's being kicked out, of, he's being 86th out of Egypt. Get out of here, you bum. Come here, lying to me. But isn't the beautiful thing in all of this, Abraham's out of God's will, Sarah's complicit yet heartbroken that their plan ended up this way, but who intervenes? God intervenes. Ladies, aren't you thankful that the Lord can protect you (laughs) when the men in your life make some bad decisions? You're like, Jesus, please rescue me. Please help me from what's going on. And God plagued Pharaoh. God intervenes on Sarah's behalf. The Bible says in, in Peter that Sarah is this incredible godly woman. She loves God also. And no doubt, she's praying like crazy. Oh, Jesus, 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 help me. Now, obviously, this is the Old Testament. But Jesus says that Abraham rejoiced to see his day and saw it in a prophetic way. Abraham saw through the ages and saw the Savior coming to the world. However that happened, it's a bit of a mystery, and we're not sure. But he knew the Savior was going to come through him. And Sarah also is this tremendously godly woman. And she cries out, and God rescues her. God intervenes through these conflicts when we're just asking for God to deliver us. And maybe right now you found yourself as a couple. Maybe you're just in a pickle. And you're just crying out for God to rescue you. God is so faithful. He's so kind. His mercies are new every morning. God doesn't say, hey, Abraham, I give up on you. I called you to go to Israel. And here you've, you've bailed out because there was some... Uh, famine in the land. No, God never gives up on us. The good work that he begun in you, he's going to bring it to completion. The good work work that he started in Abraham and Sarah, he's going to bring it to completion. And he's going to do that in your life and in my life too, because that's who God is. But now the conflict is conquered because notice, as I said at the beginning in verse 10, that he went down to Egypt, but now he comes up out of Egypt in verse 1 of chapter 13. Then Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and lot with him to the south. Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver and in gold, and he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning. This is so important. He goes back to that place where he was right with God, back to the beginning, and he camped between Bethel and Ai to the place of the altar which he had made there at the first. He goes there 
back to the beginning, at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord and he prays. He's back in the land. It doesn't say that the severe famine left. He just went back into the center of the severe famine and trusted God. And discovered that he should have never left in the first place. What do you do when you totally get off track, folks, and you go down a wrong street for a long time and you make a mess of your life? You just turn around, change your mind, change your direction. That's what repentance means. It means to change your mind. It means to change your direction. It means to go back to that place. So he goes back to that place in the promised land that was there at the beginning, and he camps between the house, or the house of God, that's what Bethel means, and Ai, which means the heap of ruins. I shared with you guys last week, this is where Abraham camped, because all of our lives are camped between, if we know God, right? I can have fellowship with God, or I can make my life a pile of ruins. Which will I choose? But he's got his tent, and he, bring, he has the place of altar where he sacrifices, so he gets clean through the sacrifices that he offers God. And he calls upon the name of the Lord. And in that moment, all you have to do is turn to the Lord, and boom, man, you're just right all of it immediately. Isn't that great? It has been said that if you'll just turn towards God, he'll take a step toward you. If you take a step toward God, he will run to you. If you run towards God, God will fly to you. God's heart is for you. He's just waiting for that moment. Just turn, turn, turn back to him. Come out of your, your conspiracy, I mean, your, your uh, the collaboration to lie and you know, keep things on the down low in Egypt and just make a mess of your life. Turn from all that and come back home like the prodigal. You know, it's what the prodigal, he's poor and he's feeding pigs, which for a Jewish boy is anathema. Right? It's the worst because they're an unclean animal. And he's feeding these pigs. It says pods, like you would think of pea pods or something. He's feeding these pods. And as he is, he's starving to death because there's a great famine there too. And he's feeding. And it, for the first time, he looks at the pig food and actually he's so hungry. The pig food that he's slopping the hogs with, it actually looks appetizing and he wants to eat it. And it's in that moment, it says, and he came to himself. It's like the light bulb, like the aha moment. It's a and he goes, what am I doing here? My father's a wonderful, loving father. I just, I just need to go home. That's all I need to do. I'm not worthy to be called his son anymore. But it, and when his dad sees him in the parable, the father runs to him and throws his arms around him, hugs him and kisses him and says, hey, get sandals for his feet. Get a new robe. Kill the fatted calf. And that's the experience that Abram, this Old Testament disciple, is now experiencing as he comes back to the promised land. For some here, even though you're in the room, you're in the house of the Lord, some of you have been visiting the heap of ruins. And you're wondering as you've been you're like, hey, I just, I just don't think God can meet my needs in this area of my life. I don't think God can meet my needs in this marriage. I, I don't think God can meet my needs in this situation. And, and I'm going kind of through a conflict in my soul, kind of a famine in my soul. And, and I'm about ready to step away from everything that God has promised and everything that is good from God. God's just calling you, hey man, just come home. If you're tempted to go down to Egypt, don't go. Right? It's not going to be good for you. It's not going to be good for your family. It's not going to be good for your marriage. But then there's a conflict in the opposite direction. Ay, ay, ay. Is it life? You just go through one trial and you're just like, woo, we got through that and boom, something else shows up on Monday morning. Life is just a series of trials. Somebody said, you're either going into a trial, you're in the middle of a trial, or you're coming out of a trial. That's just kind of life. So now they have a trial which is a weird trial, a trial of prosperity. What? You mean you can have too much stuff? Abraham does. We read earlier in verse 2 that he is very rich. It is this word kabod, which means to be heavy with wealth. He's heavy with silver and gold and cattle and everything. I mean, he's a very wealthy individual. In verse 5, he has a conflict with prosperity. So Lot also, who went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents, 
Now the land was not able to support them that they might dwell together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. And the Canaanites and the Perizzites then dwelt in the land. So Abram said to Lot, Please, let there be no strife between you and me and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brethren. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If you you take the left, then I will go to the right, or if you go to the right, then I will go to the left. Abram's the mature one. In this conflict, they both have so much wealth, and there's a famine, so you have to really scatter your sheep out and your cattle out to be able to openly graze. And so there's all this conflict. You see a patch of grass up there, and the herdsmen are trying to get their livestock to it, and they're in conflict. So now there's so much prosperity between Lot and Abram that the mature one, Abraham, he's the older one. He is, has seniority, so to speak. He's the one that God said to come to this land. But he, in such humility, passes this test with flying colors because he said, you know what, Lot? You know, we're family. Is there anything worse than the family business when you get in conflict? If you've been a part of a family thing and, and, and just a, that dynamic that is there, because it makes it worse, right? And, and Lot's that guy You see, Lot's the guy, though the New Testament does call him righteous Lot. He knows God, he loves God, but Lot is the guy that he's only really strong in his walk with God when he's with Abram. You know somebody like that? Like they're only, they attach themselves to somebody, and and that's the only time that they're strong. If that other person's out of their life. Now, through all of the things, Lot could cling to Abram, his uncle, because his uncle had this stellar faith, even with his lapses of faith that he had in Egypt. By the way, Lot got, went along down to Egypt and he learned his ways down there and everything they brought out of there is gonna cause problems down the road because they brought Hagar, a female slave, which we'll get to in chapter 16 and she causes all kinds of problems through Abram and Sarah, once again, trying to help God out and take a shortcut to his plan. But Lot, the one thing Lot couldn't handle was prosperity. For every nine people that can handle adversity, one out of 10 can handle prosperity. Because prosperity and wealth just makes you more of who you are. It's, it's an accelerant. You see a 22 year old that gets a $10 million contract in football. And he's already you know, a party animal extraordinaire, but he doesn't have actually enough money to OD because <laughs> he's a poor college student. But now he's got this accelerant wealth. And now with the wealth between these two, Abram in his maturity says, you know what? We're family. Which way do you want to go? Abram, a- Abram should have been able to choose the choicest part of Israel, right? God called him there. Lots of the tag along, but in his maturity, he goes, you know what? You go to the right, I'll go to the left. You, go, you want the left? I'll go to the right. Your choice, Lot. Let's just, let's, let's get over this conflict that we're having with all of your herdsmen and my herdsmen. And the Canaanites and the Perizzites, they're, they're observing all this. They see our strife, and they're snickering about, you know, these are supposedly men that follow Yahweh, the true and living God. And now Lot makes his choice. This is the conflict of choices. What would you choose? Abraham, he gives Lot the choice, and it says in verse 10, Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of the Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord before destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land, what? He was just there, the land of Egypt, as you go down to Zoar. Then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated from each other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the city of the plain, and pitched his in even as far as Sodom, but the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. These are the things that the reputation may have been out, but we don't know that Abram at this time and Lot knew that the city of Sodom and Gomorrah was as wicked as it is. It is overrun by homosexuality. It is, we'll see it a little later, but Abraham has to rescue Lot twice from his choices because he just wants the prosperous place. You see, 
In Ezekiel 16, it tells us why Sodom and Gomorrah ended up into its sexual uh, perversion. Because they had abundance of bread, idleness of time, because it was so easy to grow things. They didn't have to work hard, so they had a lot of extra time. And if you put, have people with a lot of extra time, what do you do? Well, they just start turning into sexual things. And so the prosperity, well, why is it the most beautiful place in the country, whether it's San Francisco, Southern California, it's easy to grow things, things just, it's, it's just beautiful, right? And the prosperity of things and the beauty of things and people, man, we want to live here. There's no place like Southern California with this Mediterranean vibe. If you go to Florida, it's muggy and buggy, right? You go to Texas, it's muggy and buggy. You, you go to the Gulf Coast, it's different. You go to the East Coast, it's different. There's no place like this place. 40 million people in this state. Why? Because of the beauty of it and everybody's attracted to it. Why is it that California is also known as the most perverse state in the union? You see, there's nothing new under the sun. You build up big metropolitan areas with a lot of prosperity and what's going to happen? Decadence. Immorality. Why is it that people are scattered through rural communities more traditional values, more conservative. They have, you know, uh, a whole uh, culture of community. So different. Here, Lot, it says that this is the, pro the prospect when you see prosperity. It says that he looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah, then he went towards Sodom and Gomorrah, then he pitched his tent towards Sodom and Gomorrah, and when we get to chapter 18, 19, he's in the city gate. He's actually on the city council in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. So you just move in, move in, move in, move in. Did it take its toll on his family? Absolutely. His wife so loved the prosperity that when the angels drag him out, she turns around to go back and she turns into a pillar of salt. You see, he was godly, but his wife wanted what Sodom offered. When he went to his son-in-laws to tell him, we gotta get out of here, God's gonna judge this city. It says his son-in-laws laughed in his face as if he was joking because his witness had been powerless. Lot's a guy that he's only strong in relationship with someone who has a strong faith. There was a guy at our church, he had an extended large family, wonderful, just a steady Eddie, I mean, solid, godly guy, and all of his grown kids and the grandkids, they just came, because he was just a stellar individual. And they came for years, 10 years, I watched this family. He was the, the, the real uh, leader of the family in the most kind way. And when he passed away, that family exploded. Within a year, the daughter that was in her 30s with a, three, three kids would come to services and try to get into our offices and go through and rob the purses of our staff members because she had become a meth addict. addict. One thing after another, the entire family, because their godliness and their Sunday relationship and their connection to everything to do with God seem to be wrapped up in their relationship with dad, not their relationship with God. You know, if you have a secondhand relationship, some people are, well, you know, uh, your spouse is the strong one. Now, don't get me wrong. There's different levels of maturity in husbands and wives and couples and various things, but Ultimately, each of us need to be strong in our own walk with the Lord. And Lot doesn't have that. But in this conflict that we see taking place, they separated. But it's now that God can clearly speak to Abraham. This is the second time that he's spoken to him. Now this conflict is conquered. He conquers the conflict by Egypt, by getting out of Egypt and coming back to the place to worship the Lord. He now separates from Lot. Lot's name means veil or covering. And this veil or covering that is, is basically holding back God's revelation to Abraham because it says, as soon, in verse 14, and the Lord said to Abraham after Lot had separated from him. God was waiting for Lot to go away so that God could do what he wanted to do in Abram's life. Sometimes God is waiting for somebody to go away, for you finally to separate that relationship. Sometimes it's a partnership, 
right? Your partners in business. And maybe you start off, you're both Christians and one of you is the stronger Christian and you're the stronger Christian is just like, hey, this, this company is just to, so we can pay the bills and serve God. But then when prosperity happens, that other person that's not quite so spiritual, no, 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 it's all about the money, about the money. And you start having all this conflict between the two of you. And sometimes you just have to separate and you go, wow, now this, here's, here's the relief here. Whew. Now I can really hear the Lord. I mean, in the last six months, all I'm doing is like in this conflict. So these two separate, and then it says, after Lot had separated from him, the Lord said, lift up your eyes in verse 14 now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, westward, for all the land which you see I give to you and your descendants forever. I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. This is God's promise on this day here in chapter 13 of the book of Genesis. And they're still debating at the United Nations if Israel has the right claim to the land of Israel because they want to give it to the Palestinians. God, this is God's promise to the Jewish people, and they have this land. But now that he has a breath of fresh air and the conflict, the relational conflict has moved away, Lot, he's going towards Sodom and Gomorrah, he's going to have his own problems, but now God can speak to me. Now God can speak to you when you separate those things. What are those relationships that are just like hammering away at you? They just absorb your time, your energy, your thoughts, all of these things. And sometimes when you just say, Lord, help me. Help me bring a separation so I can hear from you. I want to I wanna hear from you and walk with you in relationship with you. And then he tells him, look to the north, the south, the east, the west. All this land I give to you. And I give it to your descendants. This is a promise of God. All your kids are going to grow up here. They're going to live in this land. There's going to be so many Jews that you're not even going to be able to count them all. And this is the promise of God. Did God fulfill it? We're fortunate enough to be 4,000 years later to see, say he absolutely did fulfill it. There is the nation there of Israel. And he now can see exactly what God wants to do. You see, this training process, though, is just beginning in Abraham's life. He's 75 years old, you guys. He's going to live to be 175. He's got 100 years. Have you ever thought the Christian life's a long time? <laughs> right? Especially if you got saved young. If you got saved young, you're like, holy smokes. 80 years of surrendering my life to Jesus. <laughs> That's a lot of dying to the flesh. That's a lot of, you know, obedience and, and walking with God. But he's got 100 years that God's going to work in his life. And now we see this conflict concluded as he moves his tent one more time. In verse 18, Then Abram moved his tent and went and dwelt by the Terebinth trees of Mamre, which are in Hebron, and built an altar there to the Lord. Four things happen at the end of this chapter that he's now, he's come back out of Egypt. Praise God. He's turned away from that, that, that season of sin and trusting himself rather than trusting God. He's now separated the strife between him and Lot. Now God is speaking to him clearly. And now he's in the land. He's, he's resting in the Lord. And it says that he moves his tent and he goes to the trees of Mamre. So he's in the shade of Mamre, which means fatness and strength. Why was he running to Egypt? Because he was afraid of the famine. God said, you know, if you just camp out with me, come camp out underneath these trees. I'm going to fill you with strength. I'm going to fill you with fatness, meaning blessing in your life. And it's uh, which are in Hebron. Hebron means fellowship. You're going to have fellowship with me. And there he built the altar so that he can offer the sacrifices to get clean and washed by the blood of the animals that he's sacrificing. A picture that one day you and I can be cleansed by the blood of the lamb. It's like Isaiah said in Isaiah 118. He said, hey, come together. Let us reason. Though your sins be like scarlet, they'll be as white as snow. They'll be red as crimson, they'll be as white as wool. Let, let's get together and talk. Let, let's reason this out. The book of Jeremiah gives us a great picture for us and for what God's doing in Abram's life. And that is, the Lord told 
Jeremiah one day, go down to the potter's house and I'm gonna teach you there. So he goes down to the potter's house, a very common scene in ancient Israel. He goes down to the potter's house, he sits down, there's a potter, there's the clay, and there's the wheel. And so the, you know, the potter's got his foot pedal, he's pumping the wheel, the wheel's spinning, potter's doing his work, he's working the clay. You see, in that illustration, the Lord tells Jeremiah basically, I'm the potter, the Lord is the potter of your life. You're the clay, and the circumstances of your life are the wheel. So ever feel like your life's going like this? <laughs> wah, wah. No wonder I'm dizzy, right? <laughs> and, and the Lord is, is, is he's shaping you through the circumstances to grow your faith. And sometimes we just hate the circumstances that say this Saturday night finds us in. And we just hate our circumstances. But it's a part of the plan that God is doing. Now, in this story, Jeremiah is sitting there watching the potter work with the clay, and then the clay is marred in the potter's hand, meaning there's a hard spot in the clay. Like the clay, it's almost like, the, a, you know, obviously clay has no mind of its own, right? It's just clay. But in this picture, it says, and it was marred in his hand, meaning it was this hard spot. It's almost like this stubborn clay goes, you're not going to make me into that, right? <laughs> this lump of clay. It's like, oh, and the potter goes, oh. I was going to make a beautiful vase. Okay. Let's do something different. <laughs> because we're, our responsiveness to God, that's our part. He's the potter. Can I argue with God what he's creating me to be? He's the potter. I have no idea. When a potter begins to mess with a lump of clay, he already knows in his mind what he's going to make. The clay doesn't know, right? The wheel circumstances, they don't know. The wheel doesn't know. So God is shaping in your life as the potter, and you are the clay. And the goal for the clay is just to be moldable, be malleable in his hands, to allow him to do what I, whatever he wants me to be is going to be the best purpose for my life. Where, however, he brings the circumstances in my life to move me here, to move me there, to what he wants to do. His, his plan for me is the best because he's the potter and I'm the clay. But in that process, sometimes we're resistant to the potter's hand. Think of Joseph. Joseph has these beautiful dreams. These beautiful dreams, he tells his brothers, which he probably shouldn't have, his brothers hate his guts even more, right? He tells them these beautiful dreams. And they're about the brothers bowing down to him sometime in the future. And he says, even the sun and the moon, even my mom and dad are going to bow down to me. He has these incredible, it's like the, the Lord gave him a blueprint, a vision of the future, but all the circumstances after that is him being on the potter's wheel and the circumstances forging his life. His brothers hate him, they throw him into a pit, they sell him to slavery, he's very pr prosperous there in the house of Potiphar. Potiphar's wife tries to basically rape him and then she says he tried to rape her, so he, then he goes to prison, and then he's forgotten by the baker and the, the butler and that whole dynamic. He goes through this whole thing, and if you were to ask him, hey, how's, how's, how's the potter doing forming you with these circumstances? You say, this wheel sucks. <laughs> right? There's a pit. I'm being lied about. I'm now on the sex offender list of Egypt. I'm a prisoner. He becomes the ultimate trustee. But you see, Joseph had one thing going for him that each of us also can choose to do. The only thing in all the circumstances that were out of Joseph's control that he can control is his response to him. It's his response. So when he's a slave in Potiphar's house, he says, well, if I'm going to be a slave, I guess I'll be the best slave I possibly can. And he starts running the whole household. He gets lied about, about his sex uh, a sex crime that he didn't commit. He gets thrown into prison. He goes, well, I'm in prison. I might as well run the place. Doesn't matter where he goes. He makes a decision not to be bitter, but to grow better in the hope that the potter has a plan through the circumstances of his life, and God is going to fulfill it. We see this happening in Abram's life. God is the potter. He is the clay. These are the circumstances surrounding his life. And you personally have intimate details of the circumstances of your life that even tonight God is at work 
working in your life, by pressure, by position, by some people rejecting you, some people hating you, you getting fired from this job, you having to move here, you had things that are out of your control that the only thing you have control of is to respond and not be bitter and to trust God for his goodness. God, I trust you. I don't know what's going on, but I trust you. And through those processes, you will watch God work and do a work that changes you from glory to glory to glory as you seek his face. And others will be in awe of what God is doing in you and through you and your response to it. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your kindness. Thank you for meeting with us tonight. Thank you for sharing your word with us and your wonderful servant, Abraham, that you would just do a work to uh, lead us, each one of us. Lord, I just pray for those who are here tonight. and Lord, they're, they're overwhelmed by their circumstances. And uh, they find themselves in a place that they're just really needing your direction to Bring them into your beautiful will. Lord, we just wanna, we wanna pray for them. Sometimes it's an individual. Sometimes it's a family in crisis. Sometimes it's a husband and wife. They're just looking for direction for a new season in their life. And Lord, I, I ask that you would just do that work by your spirit in each one tonight. So we're just in an attitude of prayer here tonight. If there's something you just really want the Lord to give you some clear direction in, to bring you through in this, the series of circumstances you're going through. Just stand up by faith and we're gonna pray for you. We don't know what's going on, the people around you, it doesn't matter what they're thinking. We're just, we just wanna pray for you. And if you have something that really is a burden on your heart tonight and you want the Lord's direction, just stand, stand up wherever you're at. God bless you guys back there. Amen. Jesus says the men and women in this room are standing up and just by faith opening their hearts saying, Lord, I, I just run out of my own resources. Maybe there's a famine in their soul, Lord. I just pray that you would strengthen them with faith, that they could trust you, that you are the answer. You are their hope. You are their strength. You that you would lead them in a way everlasting, a way that is abundant with life by your spirit. I pray for clarity for those who are standing up. Just They just wanna know whether to go to the right or the left. They're not sure. And the confusion of where they're at, Lord, that you would just give them that they would hear that voice behind them in this coming weeks, that they hear your voice behind them saying, as they turn to the right or the left, this is the way, walk in it. Lord, lead them into that place that, like the cool shade of the trees and the fatness and strength and the, the cleansing of your blood, Jesus, to pardon them and to forgive them for their sin. Lord, I pray for those who are just in a season of sin and they're just standing saying, Lord, I, I just wanna come home to you. I wanna get right with you. I wanna come back to that place of intimacy with you and to hear from you. Lord, I pray for those who are just struggling with the bitterness of the circumstances that are out of their control and, and they just simply have been struggling with a hard heart and unforgiveness towards those who they think are the perpetrators. And yet, Lord, as the potter in this wheel of circumstance, Lord, it's you allowing things in their life. It's you working all things together for good to bring them into that place with a future and a hope that you have for them. Lord, I just pray that you would pour out your spirit to fill them with a deep sense of peace to guard their hearts, their emotions, and their mind, their thoughts. Even as they sleep tonight, Lord, I pray that you would give them deep rest, maybe for the first time in weeks, to rest and trust in you. Lord, have your hand on them in your kindness, Lord. Have mercy as we ask for your help and come boldly before your throne of grace to find that help. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen.